Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory combinatorics based on my book, An Invitation to Combinatorics. The topic of this lecture is using balls and boxes as a metaphor for counting problems. Um, so uh, this is just going to be a framework for how we can think about counting problems um, as we go along. So um, the idea is that you can think of a lot of uh, counting problems with the following uh, way of thinking about it. Say that you have S balls and you have T boxes and uh, you have two cases. It could be that your balls are all distinct. They're all di they're different from each other. Each one of them maybe has a number on it or maybe they're all identical and you can't tell them apart. And the same for the boxes. They could be all distinct. Maybe they have um, a color or maybe they have a letter written on them or maybe they're all identical. And um, the boxes also have specific capacity restrictions. It might be that you can't put more than one ball in the boxes, or, or maybe that you have to put at least one ball in the boxes, or maybe some box can only take an odd number of balls. So those are capacity constraints on, on, on the boxes. And the question then becomes, in how many ways can you place all the balls that you have into the boxes. Some of the boxes might end up being empty, but all the balls have to be distributed. And surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, that many counting problems fit this framework. And um, in fact, being able to translate from one way of thinking of a problem to another way um, is always very important in all of mathematics, but especially in combinatorics. In combinatorics, often counting problems can be thought of in several different ways. And it's fruitful and helpful to be able to switch uh, one's point of view from one way of thinking about accounting problem to another. And, and in this uh, uh, particular lecture, this short lecture, I'm not going to actually solve a lot of counting problems, but I'm going to get some practice in switching things from other formats into a balls and boxes uh, format. So let's look at uh, some examples. So let's say that um, a bakery has unlimited supply of five types of pastries. And, um, and then you want to know how many ways you can pick a dozen. So five types of pastries, you could take all of them from one type, you could just pick the donuts, or you could pick uh, some other kind of thing, or you could distribute your dozen uh, among the different kinds of pastries. And, and each way that of picking that, you want to know how many ways can you do that. So um, how are we going to do that? We're going to assign one box for each type of, uh, uh, of pastry, and, and, and we're going to have 12 identical balls. The balls are going to tell us which pastry we are going to pick. And placing of the balls in the boxes, if you take your 12 balls and put them in the boxes, every time you put a ball in a box, that means that you're picking um, that pastry. And, um, and, 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 and because you have 12 balls, that's telling you um, how, um, how you pick your dozen pastries. Uh, but the boxes are distinguishable. They're all distinct. They're different from each other. There's one box for each pastry. So each box has a label on it that tells you which pastry you're picking and there's no capacity constraints you could you don't have to use a box and you could put all your ball 12 balls in that same one box so there's no capacity constraints and so um the question of how many ways can you put 12 identical balls in five distinct boxes is exactly the same as asking how many ways uh, you can pick 12 uh, a dozen um, of these five types of pastries. And again, I'm not going to solve the problem here, but, but we just translated it to a different problem. We could also translate this problem to a problem about non-negative integer solutions. So the same problem has the same answer as the question, how many non-negative integer solutions are there to x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 equals 12? So why is that? So what, first of all, what is non-negative integer solutions? So look at this equation, x1 plus all the way till x5 equals 12, and I want integer solutions. I don't want answers where x1 is 2.5. And I want the solutions to be non-negative. I don't want negative answers. So I want, I, I, you, you're allowed to put zero or five or 10, but I want these numbers to add up 12. x1 is going to be the number of paste, uh, pastry of type one I'm gonna pick, X2 is going to be type two, the number of type two pastry, and all the way to X5, the number of type five pastry. And, and they need to add up to 12. And, and so any way that you can find me in X1 and X2, X3, X4, and X5, where all of them are non-negative integers and add up to 12 is exactly one way of 
uh, uh, finding, um, uh, how, uh, picking a dozen pastries. And so the number of um, uh, non-negative integer solutions, one solution is five numbers, one for x1, one for x2, one x3, one for x4, x5. That's just one solution. How many solutions you have is exactly the same as, as before. And, and all of these problems you can solve. And in fact, uh, we will solve in, in future uh, lectures. And, and the answer to this particular one, if I haven't done it wrong, and I might, I might have, and if I have, um, you will tell me in, in the comment section, is 1820. Um, and you might want to try it. Um, but we'll get back to these in future lectures when we actually solve these um, the balls and boxes problems um, in various which, for, which ways. So let's say that the bakery still has an unlimited supply of five types of pastry. And, and again, you want to um, um, pick a dozen. But, um, and, and we said that that's the same as putting 12 identical balls in five distinct boxes and the boxes having no capacity restrictions. But what if you want um, an odd number of the second pastry? Maybe that's a requirement that you have, that of the second type of pastry, you don't, you either want one, three, five, seven, nine, or 11, and, and nothing else you, you're gonna take for some reason or another. Or maybe for, for the third type of pastry, you want at most three. So you, you're, you will allow zero, one, two, or three, but not anymore. So how would you solve those kinds of problems? Well, those you can, I, again, we're not talking about how you would solve such a problem, but we're talking about how you would reformulate it um, with the balls and boxes metaphor. And this would be the same balls and boxes metaphor. You're putting 12 identical balls in five distinct boxes, but you would have capacity constraints on some or all of the boxes. So in the, fir in, in the first uh, variant, when you want an odd number of um, second pastry, you would say that the second box can only take an, um, um, its capacity can, has, is only odd. You can only put an odd number of balls in there. Um, and in, this, in, in, in the other one where you want um, uh, at most thir three of the third pastry, you would say the third box, its capacity can be either zero, one, two, or three. So again, by changing those capacity constraints, um, you, can, you can come up with a variety of different problems. And, and, and the question then becomes, can you solve them or not? Here's another problem. Let's say you have this seven distinct books, seven different books. And what you want to do is you want to arrange four of them on a shelf. So you have a shelf and you want to arrange them. Arrangements on a shelf are permutations where order matters. I mean, on the shelf, it matters which book comes first, which one second, which one third, and which one fourth. This problem is not actually um, not that hard. You can solve it right now if you wanted to. I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in showing you how to translate that to a balls and boxes problem. And here you take a box for each. What do you think um, for, for, for the position on the shelf? or for a box for each book? And the answer is gonna be, you, you want a box for each book and, the, and, the, I will, and, and not for the, for the, for the positions. You, and that might be slightly counterintuitive, but the reason for that is that um, uh, you might, you, we, in this case where we have seven balls and uh, seven books, sorry, and four spaces on the shelf, we're not gonna use all the, all, all the books. And so, and so, the books could not be balls because the balls are always going to be placed um, in the boxes. So, so we're going to have a box for each book um, and we're going to have four distinct balls labeled one, two, three, four. And these are the positions on the shelf. So e every time you place uh, uh, the balls in the boxes, you are going to pick uh, four of the books because uh, you have four balls. Um, but not only that, because the, box, the balls have a label on them, you're also picking uh, the spot on the shelf. So if you put ball two um, in, in the box for um, this one book, uh, then you're saying that uh, um, that book, you're picking it, but you're also putting it in, in the second spot. And so here the boxes are distinguishable and they have capacity at most one because, you, uh, because there are seven distinct books. And so um, you do not want to choose any box, um, 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 any box, more than once uh, you, if you can't put two balls in, in the same box. And so the question becomes, in how many ways can you put four distinct balls in seven distinct boxes with no box getting more than one ball? So, so the, we have translated that. And in fact, the answer to this question is pretty straightforward. How many choices you have for the first spot? Well, you have seven books, you have seven choices. The next one's six, 
the next one four, the next one four, four, four. So seven times six times five, five, four, the answer is 840. But again, the point here is that um, even though the problem is sort of slightly straightforward, um, you can do this, um, use, you can translate it to uh, a balls and boxes problem. Now, let's, what if you had two copies of uh, each of seven distinct books and you wanted to arrange four on a shelf? How many possible ways? Now, this time you might you pick two of the same copy and where you put them matters and the problem becomes a lot harder. And so this time um, um, you're putting uh, four distinct balls in seven distinct boxes. Again, one box for each book and 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 four balls for uh, for um, the positions. And these are distinct balls with labels on them, one, two, three, four, which tells you where the book is. Not only are you gonna choose the book, but where it's going to go. But this time you're gonna allow uh, every box to get zero, one, or two, because you, you are allowed to pick um, up to two uh, copies uh, of, of any, any, any book. This is a considerably harder problem. Um, and we will actually do it much later using exponential generating functions. They might, there might be other ways of doing this particular problem, but these kinds of problems uh, can be done with exponential generating functions. And uh, the answer will be, if you wanna try it, and again, if I haven't made a mistake, which is quite possible, 2,226. Now this time, let, let's have a, a final example. If you have one copy of each of seven distinct books, and we just want to pick four books. Not we don't want to put them on a shelf anymore. We just want to pick and put them on a box. So so it doesn't the order doesn't matter anyway. How many possible ways? If if you know about combinations, this is a combinations problem. In a future lecture, we will talk about binomial coefficients and and um, and and combinations in some detail. But but right now, again, all we want to do is translate this to a balls and boxes problem. So again, a box for each book um, and four identical balls this time, because this time we don't want to uh, know where in the shelf we're gonna put the the, 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 the the books. We just wanna pick one. We just have four balls that we're gonna put um, in, in the boxes. And again, each place of the balls in the boxes corresponds to one way of picking the four books. And the boxes are distinguishable because they're different books and they all have capacity at most one. Um, because again, we can just pick one uh, one of each of the books. Um, and the answer to this is 35, uh, if you care to know. Now, again, you could change the problem. I changed it to two copies um, and you want to pick that. And the problem translates to the same thing, except again, you change the capacity to at most two and the answer changes and becomes 161. And this becomes, again, slightly harder problem. Okay, so... In general, what we, we will have this counting table, these different kinds of problems that balls and boxes tells us. And, and a whole bunch of them we're gonna write down. And then we're gonna, throughout this uh, series of lectures, videos, we will go through this whole table and, 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 and this will be a way of organizing our counting problems. So we wanna know the number of ways of putting balls in boxes. Um, the, the balls we, we will denote by the set of balls will be S, the set of boxes will be T, there will be little s balls and little t boxes. Um, when you put absolute value sign in front of a set, that's the size of the set. So we have little s balls and t boxes, and we want to put the balls in the boxes. Um, and the i box contains ui balls. That's the uh, capacity constraints. And so um, the conditions on, on the balls and boxes um, could be that um, the boxes are distinct or identical, and the balls could be identical or distinct. So that gives us four combinations of things. Uh, the balls being um, uh, distinct and the boxes being distinct, the boxes being distinct, but the balls being identical to each other um, and so forth. So we have four different columns uh, depending on whether or not the balls and the boxes are identical to each other or, or distinct. But we also have capacity constraints, conditions on the U, U you remember was how many balls can go in a, in, a, in a box. Um, the first one, for example, uh, the first row is when uh, the capacity is either zero or one. You can pick a box, put a ball in a box um, or not, but but um, you can't put more than one ball in a box. And 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 I will we get four uh, counting problems in that way. Um, our, our second row will be when there's no constraints on, on, on the capacities and, and you can put um, anywhere from zero up to any number of balls you have in any of the boxes. And those will give us 
four other problems. In our, for our third row, we will, um, our condition will be that every box will have to get at least one ball. Um, and and we, you can't leave any boxes empty. Um, and of course, if you, if you don't have enough balls, the answer is going to be zero. But, but, but um, uh, in general, again, we'll get um, four other uh, problems. And in fact, um, these um, 12 counting problems are called the 12, uh, tw 12 way. Um, and 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 then just sort of the most common counting problems. We will actually have a, a couple of more. Um, we will have the condition where each box has between zero and a pre-designed number, a designated number. So for example, ball, box one can take between zero and five, maybe. Box two can take between zero and 10 um, and so forth. And so, um, and, and those NI can even be infinite. And so, so in that way, we will have two other counting problems um, that that we will deal with, and the most general of all will be when when um, our conditions will be weird. Like for example, we'll say box one can have only odd number of uh, um, uh, balls in it, and box five can have um, only up to three, and and so forth. And and we can't solve all of these things, but most of them. But we'll have techniques that might work, and and in fact, in for these la latter ones, we will use generating functions. So n i is a is a subset of the non-negative integers, and and um, and and what we're going to say is that um, ui how many balls go that goes into the ith box has to be an element of this set. So this is as, as general as it gets, and it actually includes all of these other possibilities. But but for each of these, we might have an actual nice answer, whereas for this last one, we will have a technique that may or may not work. So again. Um, balls and boxes are a way of thinking about and organizing our uh, our counting problems. And throughout this series of lectures, we'll come back to them and one by one knock out um, each one of these. Um, this is the end of this lecture. Um, if you if you like or uh, subscribe uh, uh, to my channel, uh, then you will be rewarded by Google spamming your uh, your feed with more videos of this kind. See you till next lecture.